know, how blessed are we that we serve a God that is our rock and our refuge in times of trouble. Let's lift our voices and sing today to the one who's the foundation on which we stand. I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the winds, they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. us. It makes us whole. It pardons. It cleanses. It atones for sin. It is our hope and peace in righteousness. It is by this blood that we overcome and by this blood that we make it home.
Right now in this moment, we're going to continue with our worship this morning as we partake in communion together. Um, I'd like to share a scripture with you in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And it says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. And as I was kind of thinking about that that, that verse, uh, kind of got me thinking of the times that June and I wrestle and how I have him in bondage or I'm wrapped up. And he's yelling for Jesse, Mom, come help me. Uh, set me free. And uh, I was kind of kind of reflecting on that, especially in my life of, of the moment that I realized that, man, I needed Jesus, that I was in bondage and, and that I kind of remembering the, the night that I cried out and said, Jesus, I need your help. Come set me free. And, um, and so, uh, man, with Jesus, He's the only one that can set us free. And, uh, and, uh, and so that verse has kind of got me thinking, and, and, and especially right now as I'm doing communion, just being grateful and just, and just uh, and, and blessed that what Christ did on the cross for us to, to set us free from the bondage of sin, to, to not living the life of death but now because of Christ we get to have a life to to have a good life and man just this this morning I'm just very grateful and thankful for Jesus and so I kind of want you to reflect on maybe where you were in the past maybe the moment that that you said Jesus I need your help help me free me and we need to know and just and, and just thank God right in this moment and thank Jesus for setting us free of, of living a life that, man, we're going down the path of death, but now that through Jesus we have life and life everlasting. And, and again, I don't know about you, but man, praise Jesus for that. I am set free. We are set free. And so um, uh, just be grateful today and uh, and and just honor him today um, with your life and and so uh, let me pray and uh, let's partake in communion and just and just honor Jesus and just worship him uh, this morning, uh, Father God. We just thank you for your Son Jesus. Only you can set us free. And this morning, that I am grateful. I am blessed that you have set me free. That. I was on the path of destruction, but through you, I have life and life everlasting. Lord. I just thank you for the, your, your, your body that you gave, the blood that you shed. You are the perfect sacrifice. And we thank you for what you did on the cross this morning. And everybody said amen. There's a time that we all know by reading the Gospels that Jesus was his disciples and man, what a what a moment that ha- could have been when Jesus got the bread and broke it and he was looking into every disciple's eyes and he's taking the bread and he says, guys, this bread represents my body, my body that I'm going to be giving. Do this in remembrance of me. And so this morning, we're going to remember what Jesus said. So this morning, joy and as we partake in the body together. And at the end, Jesus took the cup, the cup that represented the blood that was going to be shed. Um, and he said, this is the cup, the new covenant. And man... Maybe what an intense moment with the disciples trying to understand everything that Jesus is, is trying to say in that moment. But through the Gospels, we know what the new covenant is. We know what Jesus did on the cross. And so he took the cup and says, guys, this is my blood shed for you. And so this morning, join me 
as we partake in your blood. Let me pray. Again, Jesus, we thank you. We are blessed and we are grateful for what you did on the cross, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Holy Spirit, I ask as we go forward and we listen to Pastor Russell's message that you have given him to speak to us. May we have an understanding of God's word, of how we can apply God's word to our life that will just make us better grow up, make us grow stronger. And I pray that his word will be an encouragement to us today. Praise you. We lift your name on high. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. As we look ahead to the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at a world that is still afraid as we open things back up. We may not know exactly how things will go, but we do know that one thing, God is good. He is faithful, and his mercies never fail us. And even if this is not the end to the pain you've been going through, that doesn't change the fact that he is good, and we are still in his hands today. Let's sing this new song together today that reminds us about the goodness of our God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never failed me in all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God
Who ever expected life to come to an abrupt end as it has been known before? What was before? Well, all the busy daily activities that occurred every day for the women, shopping, cooking, cleaning, visiting, child care, working, praying, doing devotions, Bible study, just all the stuff that makes up a day. For the men, pretty much the same thing, working, providing for their families, making plans for the future, praying, studying the word, and again, all the stuff that makes up the day for a man. And then it all came to a halt, a gigantic halt, not an intermission for during such a time there is much activity, more like a parenthesis in which was nothing but blank space between the parenthetical markers. Certainly motions did abound. Fear, panic, anxiety, worry, worry about the future, worry about what the future would bring. Would the future bring suffering, isolation, separation, Poverty, death, how long was this going to last? Has life changed forever? Is there a new normal? Or is there never to be a return to any kind of normal again? You see, they were a relatively small church, but not really organized as a church, and we really shouldn't use the word church at this point, I suppose, for them. Just a gathering of friends who loved the Lord, who loved Jesus. The Lord Jesus had spoken to them, essentially giving them an instruction, a single word instruction. Wait. Wait? Just wait? That's it? Nothing more? Oh, there was a promise that things would get better, but no hint of how long it was going to take. And so, the 109 men and women sheltered together, and soon they were joined by 11 others, bringing their number to a total of 120. It was crowded in their meeting room, known as the upper room, but once the group was complete and together, Peter assumed his rightful position as leader. He stood up before them and led them in a point of business. A twelfth man would be selected from among them, bringing the band of apostles back to twelve after the departure, betrayal, and death of Judas. With that one piece of business out of the way, the group had nothing to do now but Wait, just as they had been instructed by Jesus, wait, just wait. You know, waiting may be one of the most difficult aspects in life. We've been waiting for over six weeks now. I forget, is this day 45 of the shelter-in-place proclamation? Waiting is very difficult. When Jesus promised that he would return, he instructed his followers to wait. He instructed the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He's instructed us to wait and watch and be ready. But you know what? Waiting is a whole lot easier said than done. What do we do in the meantime? What do we do while we wait? Most of us would rather do anything Then wait. Some of us would rather do the wrong thing than wait. Have you ever been guilty of that? Boy, I have. Impatience leads to bad decisions. Truth be told, most of life is waiting. Waiting for an appointment to see the doctor. Waiting to graduate. Waiting to be accepted into college. Waiting for your first job offer waiting to see if the bank will give you a loan, waiting for the right time to start a family, waiting for your test scores to come back, waiting for a raise or for a promotion, waiting for your loved ones to come to Christ, waiting for the Lord to bring the right man or the right woman into your life to be your spouse, 
waiting to find out what God wants you to do in life, waiting for someone to buy your house, waiting for prayers to be answered, waiting for your husband or wife to come home from a business trip, waiting for your child to come back to the Lord. Wow, we wait. We wait in line at the grocery store. We wait in line at the post office. We wait in line at the DMV. And then we wait in line some more at the DMV. Waiting. We wait in line at stoplights. We sometimes wait in line at green lights because everybody ahead of us is moving so slow. Waiting. One of the hardest parts of the Christian life. But I believe this. I believe that the Bible is very specific that waiting is a spiritual exercise. It is a spiritual discipline. When we wait, if we wait with the right attitude, doing the right things as we wait, we will find it to be one of the greatest spiritual disciplines lending itself toward growth maturity and understanding in the Christian life. Thousands take foolish and unwise action when they can't wait any longer. Yet we spend a big chunk of our lives waiting for things to happen. For a green light, it seems like there are a dozen red lights for every green one, doesn't it? We have to wait whether we like it or not. If you would like a fascinating Bible study, take your Bible concordance this week and look up the word wait. Over and over, God's people were told to wait, Old Testament and New Testament. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. In Psalm 37, 7, we read, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. When we're tempted to take matters into our own hands, um, Maybe Proverbs 20, 22 offers us some good counsel. Do not say I'll pay back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord. He will deliver you. Isaiah 30, 18 expands on the theme. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Perhaps the most famous, most beloved verse on waiting in all the Bible is Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not become weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many of you feel blessed today because of the waiting time over the last six weeks? How many feel stronger today, more invigorated today, recharged because of your time of waiting? Well, in Acts 1, 4, We've come to the last few days of life of the life of Jesus Christ on this earth before his ascension. We're in that mysterious 40-day period between Christ's resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And Luke tells us that on one occasion, just before the ascension, the disciples and Jesus shared a meal together. The conversation during that time turned to the future, to the time when Jesus would return to heaven and the disciples would be left with orders to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's easy to imagine the excitement around the table that day and possibly conversation among the 11. I imagine that maybe it went something like this. Well, what do you want us to do, Lord? When do we get started? Let's draft a master plan and hit the road. James and John should start um, putting together a mission statement for us. Peter, Peter, work out a 10-year strategy. Get Andrew to help you. Matthew, you're an accountant, aren't you? You and Philip, run some numbers. See what this is going to cost us. See how much money we're going to need. Make some plans on how we can raise that kind of funding. We've got to get this ball rolling. Lord, where do you want us to begin? And Jesus' answer was simple. And quite shocking to those over-eager disciples. Don't do anything yet. Go back to Jerusalem and wait there until the Holy Spirit comes. I'm sure this must have come as a major surprise. Here's a critical insight, I believe. When God works among his people, his first step is to tell his people to slow down and wait for him. Oh, it's so easy to run ahead of God instead of waiting for God to move us. When the time comes, I believe the Lord will give the signal to move out. Until then, 
we wait. That raises a question. Why did the disciples have to wait for what God had already promised them? Couldn't they just name it, claim it, and move on? From our text in Acts 1, I'm going to read in a moment. And from the Bible as a whole, we discover five reasons why God tells his people to wait on him. I'm going to ask you five questions this morning. And I'm going to give you five valuable purposes of waiting on the Lord. Let me read the text. If you have your Bible, open it to Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9. Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9. Luke is the author. And he writes, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift. Wait for the gift my father promised, for you have heard me speak of it. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then he gathered around him and asked, and asked him, Lord, they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time of the military takeover? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Heavenly Father, now, as we come into your word and we consider waiting, waiting upon the Lord. Lord, we are in the middle of a waiting time. Hopefully we're close to the end of it, but we've been going through this for six weeks. Waiting for our country to open, waiting for businesses to open, waiting for restaurants to open, waiting for schools to open, waiting for everything, our workplace. And waiting can be so hard. But Lord, help us not to waste this valuable time, but to grow in this discipline of waiting upon you and learning as we wait. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you some questions this morning. And, and uh, the question has to do with, what, what are we doing while we wait? I believe, and I, I said this before, I'm going to say it again. I believe that the greatest discipline, a great discipline, is waiting upon the Lord. We're so impatient that the Lord wants us to learn and to grow, and often we do that by waiting for him. So question number one is, what are your priorities? What are your priorities? I was sitting in my front yard talking to my neighbor who was sitting with me, and we were just chatting about the shutdown. He is not a believer, but he said to me, if there's one thing that I have really learned through this time, it's what are my priorities? What are my priorities? He said, I've had to think through that, and I've come to realize that my family is really my number one priority, spending time with them, communicating with them, drawing closer to them, getting to know them. He has two delightful young daughters, teenagers, and that became his number one priority. What are your priorities? What are the important things in life? Now, the number one purpose of waiting. Waiting on God causes us to rearrange our priorities. So the question is, what are your priorities? And the purpose of waiting is to teach us to come to the point of our priorities, consider them, possibly to rearrange them. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 says that Jesus commanded the disciples to stay in Jerusalem. I imagine that was the last place that many of them wanted to be. After all, 
This was the city where Jesus had been crucified. This is the city where the men who put him to death a few weeks earlier were still in power. The high priest was still the high priest. The Sanhedrin was still the Sanhedrin. The Romans were still the Romans. The enemy was still the enemy. If they killed Jesus, why wouldn't they kill his followers? Don't you think they wondered that as they waited in the upper room? Certainly, all the uproar surrounding the death of Jesus would have made them even angrier, the, the, these crowds, the, these um, authorities that were in charge. Jerusalem was no longer a safe city for the disciples. If you were a follower of Jesus, any place on earth would be safer than Jerusalem. Getting out of town was not a bad idea at all. And besides, these people, these people in the upper room, these disciples, you know, they were mostly Galileans. They were country folk. They were small village people. They were fishermen. They were outdoor people. They're in the big city. They want to be back home in Galilee in familiar territory where they're comfortable. They're outside their comfort zone. Wait in Jerusalem? But Jesus commanded them to stay there in Jerusalem. If they left, it would show a lack of courage and reveal a fear of what man might do to them. They couldn't run away. No, they couldn't run away from, from the, the instruction their Lord had given them. And, it, and you know what? Running away would also show a lack of faith. Um, if, as if they couldn't trust an unseen master to help them. They had trusted their master when they could see him. But now they must trust an unseen master. It would mean leaving the battlefield and admitting defeat if they were to run away and go back to Galilee. And this they could not do. There's another argument they might have made. They might have come to a good conclusion for why we should leave Jerusalem and launch out. Maybe the argument could have been, hey, the world needs to know about Jesus. Look at this incredible thing. Jesus rose from the dead. We need to go tell people. Jerusalem already knows about him. This city murdered him. Let's go somewhere else and spread the good news. That's a noble cause. Sometimes disobedience to the Lord sounds noble to us, but it's still disobedience. You see, with God, timing's everything. Haste gains nothing if the Lord is not leading. Plans mean nothing. Destinations mean nothing. Their duty that day was to follow, not to lead, and our duty today is to follow, not to lead. So by staying in Jerusalem and waiting, Jesus forces them to confront their fears and quells their fleshly enthusiasm. The Lord wanted things done his way, in his time, by the power of his own spirit. And he was doing a work in the 120 when they thought the only thing they were doing was waiting. Guess what, folks? I believe the Lord is doing a work in his children all across America and all around this world during this time of very much a global shutdown and certainly a national shutdown um, in, in America. But, but Christians around the world and non-Christians are being shut down in other countries as well. God is doing a work in his children. God is doing a work in my life, in your life, in the life of believers all around this globe and all across this country. And he's doing that work while we wait. He slowed us down. He silenced us. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't speak to you more clearly? Could it be that you're going too fast? That you can't hear his voice? Waiting rearranges our priorities. It slows down our schedule. It forces us to listen to God. Prior to this shelter-in-place order, life was all about my schedule, my plan, my interests, my needs, my ideas. Wow. My life changed. My schedule changed. I have a hard time remembering what day it is. I've seen a dramatic change toward the value and needs of others. And I value others, I think, more than I did before this shutdown. And I need others. And I realize others need me too. Have your priorities changed? Have your priorities changed? How so? How so? Are you like my neighbor? 
and you realize things that you didn't think were so important before are so very important now. Maybe God is using this time when your schedule is a parenthesis filled with nothing. And so the question is, what do you fill it with? Fill it with your priorities. What are your priorities, folks? Think about it. Journal it. Write it down. What are you learning about priorities in this time of waiting? Don't waste this time of waiting. Don't waste it. What are you learning? Let me give you a second question. In what is your faith or your trust? I like the word trust. Faith, we use faith a lot. And I like the word faith. But what is faith? Faith is trusting God in my life, believing that God is in control, God is in charge, God has me securely in his hands, he cares for me. In what is your faith? In what is your trust? And purpose number two of waiting on the Lord, waiting on God, is a test of our faith. It's a test of our trust. You see, it's easy to trust God for everything when you have needs of nothing. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, I have faith in God. Well, what are you trusting him for? What is your faith in God centered around? Jesus gave specific instructions in three areas to the disciples. Number one, he told them what to do. Wait. Wait. Parameno is the Greek word, parameno, perimeter, to draw a circle and stay inside of it. That's the meaning of the word. Draw a circle and stay inside of it. Wait. Number two, he told them where to do it, Jerusalem. Number three, he told them wait to, what to wait for. Now listen to this. He said that the promised gift of the Father... was going to come to them. The promised gift of the Father. Now we know that that promised gift was the coming of the Holy Spirit. The word promise in the Greek is the word announcement. The, the, the word for gift is not in the Greek, by the way, here. It uses the word gift, but it's, it's the promised announcement of the Father. The Father's going to announce something. You want to be there for the announcement. Don't miss the announcement. And Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem for the promised announcement. Jesus didn't tell them how long to wait. They had no idea whether they should wait a week, a month, a year, 10 years. Would they wait 40 years like Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness? And they didn't know what they were waiting for. Now, now if I told you, wait, and the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, you understand the meaning of wait, although you won't know how long, but you certainly understand the meaning of the Holy Spirit, that he would come upon you, empower you, change you, direct you, comfort you, guide you, help you. We understand the Holy Spirit. The disciples didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Jesus had taught them about the Holy Spirit. They had no idea what the presence of the Holy Spirit really was going to mean to them. And so, what did, what did they think? Can you imagine their confusion? Wait, wait for an announcement? And that's going to come in the form of being baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit, which is holy, hagias, pneuma, wind or breath. So there's going to be a, a holy wind? And we're going to be baptized in a holy wind? What could that mean? How will we know? You know what? Some of us are in the same place right now. We're waiting and we don't know how much longer we can wait. We don't know how much longer we can hold out. Some of us have cabin fever. We're going stir crazy. And we wonder how long we can survive with the only places that we can go are the gas station, the grocery store. Others of us can handle the shelter in place declaration but we've been waiting for something else some to maybe find a spouse to marry 
Some to find a new job or a job. Some have been waiting for the salvation of a loved one. Others a wandering child to come home. You wonder if, if prayer is a waste of time because God hasn't answered your prayers. Perhaps you've been waiting for months or years already, maybe decades, and deep inside you, you feel like giving up. Remember Abraham and Sarah who waited 25 years after God came to them and promised that they would give birth to a child, a son? 25 years! By the time they did, Abraham was 99 years old and Sarah was 90. Remember also what happened when in a moment of weakness they took matters into their own hands and Ishmael was born and the Jews and the world have suffered that decision to this very day. God makes us wait so that our faith will be put to the test. Can we trust him? Can we trust him in what is our faith? Are we really trusting God? Moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, are we trusting God? How's your faith doing during this time, folks? How's your faith growing? Like the disciples, we may not even know what we're waiting for. Um, I hope I'm waiting for things to get better, but am I waiting, in fact, things are going to get worse? No, I don't believe so, but some of the predictions are we haven't seen anything yet. But my question of you is, have you given this time to God? Are you talking to him, asking him to guide you? Asking God, what do you have for me in this time? Don't waste the time, folks. It is too precious. These weeks of sheltering are too precious. Don't waste them spiritually. Where's your faith? What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in a cure? Are you trusting in a vaccination? Are you trusting in the store, having what you need when you go there? Or are you trusting God to reveal himself to you as never before during this time of waiting? Receive the holy breath of God upon your lives. Here's his announcement. Listen to me. That's God's announcement. Let me take control. Let me take charge. Let me fill you with my presence. Hear his announcement to you, folks. And the announcement that he makes to you may only be intended for you. What is God saying to you during this time? How has your faith increased? How has your trust been magnified? Take a moment with pencil and paper. Answer the question. What are your priorities? How is your faith growing? Now let me ask you question number three. How pure are your motives? How pure are your motives? That's an interesting question when you think about it. But I often wonder, when I come to God with a prayer request... Why am I asking what I am asking? Have, have you ever let God examine your motives? Sometimes when I pray, God will check my spirit. And I hear the Spirit of God speak to me saying, are you asking this so that life will be easier for you or are you asking this so that I will be glorified? Wow, that's a convicting question. What is it I really want? When I'm sick and I pray for healing, is that so life will be easier for me or is that so that God will be glorified? And what if God would be more glorified through the strength he manifests in me through the sickness as he did with Paul? Then is that what I want? What is my motive? Is my motive pure? Is my motive godly? Is my motive righteous? 
So the third question, how pure are your motives? The purpose of waiting, the third purpose of waiting, waiting on God gives us an opportunity to let him purify our motives, cleanse our motives, examine our motives, bring to light what our motives really are. Very soon the disciples would be asked to take the gospel to the ends of the earth after this time of waiting. Very soon they would take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and to the end of the world. Vast responsibility was about to fall on them. Great things were expected and great things were required. Of all the dangers they faced, do you know what the greatest danger probably was for them? And it's the same danger that's facing the world today. No, it's not martyrdom. No, it's not rejection of the gospel. That's not our issue. That's between them and God. You know what the greatest danger facing the church in the world today is and the greatest danger for the early disciples was exactly the same. My way. My way. I'm doing it my way. You see, my way reveals itself in four dangerous ways. Number one, it reveals itself in the danger of pride, which says we did this. We figured this out. We cured it. We accomplished it. We did this in our own power. Danger number one, the danger of pride. That's what led to Satan's downfall. That's what led to Nebuchadnezzar's downfall. Look at the great things I have done. The danger of pride. Is God dealing with pride in your life? What are your motives? What are the motives behind your prayers? What are the motives behind your life? Who are you trying to please? Whose way are you trying to do things? Danger number two, the danger of walking by sight and not by faith. If I do this and this and a little of that, then God's going to have to do what he said he would do. The danger of walking by sight. Well, that sure looks like what I should be doing. That sure looks like an opportunity. But God says sometimes, don't go out and preach the gospel yet. Wait for the announcement my father is going to make. And then you will be able to go in his power not your power. Danger number three is the danger of forgetting God when the crisis is all over and going back to thinking I'm in control and my way's the best. The danger of forgetting everything you learned. That's why I really encourage you to write some things down. Write down spiritual lessons you learned. Write them in your Bible as you read your Bible. I've had my Bible for 30 years. Maybe more. And I have things written all over in my Bible. Times when I was reading my Bible and praying and going through an event in my life, a circumstance, a hurt, a dilemma, a problem, a sickness, whatever. And God spoke to me, and I've written in the margin the date and what was going on, just so that I can always remember and never forget. Oh, oh, we have this danger of forgetting. I just wonder when life goes back to normal, folks. Are we going to forget the valuable lessons we learned during the sheltering time? Are we going to forget how important fellowship really is? How important gathering on Sundays really is? What are your motives? Danger number four. Number one is the danger of pride. Number two, walking by sight and not by faith. Danger number three, the danger of forgetting God when the crisis is over. Danger number four, the danger of rejecting what I have learned through the crisis and going on with life as usual. Wow, the danger of rejecting what I've learned. Well, that was good for then. Well, that was good at the time. And then laying that aside, because I'm perfectly content to go back to my old way of doing, my old way of thinking, the old motivations I had in my life, and acting like I'm the one in control. 
You see, unknown to the 120 in just a very few days, 3,000 people would be converted all at one time. Read all about it in Acts chapter 2. Lest they think that everything depended on them to spread the news about Jesus' resurrection, God made them wait. As the days go on, and the disciples learn that the Holy Spirit cannot be bought or sold in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit cannot be manipulated. The Holy Spirit cannot be commanded by human will. Waiting would force them into a position of humility, of beggars, into a position they would become beggars, waiting on the promise of the Father. I don't know about you, but I'm learning a lot about my own inadequacy. I'm learning a lot about my weaknesses. I'm learning a lot about the abject poverty that I have during this crisis and time of waiting. This whole thing is out of my control. But it's not out of the control for the one in control, for he controls all things, even though I struggle with him for control. Listen to this. This is out of our control. But it is not out of control for the one in control, for he controls all things, though we struggle with him for control. He wants us to let go of control. Let go of our desires and wait on him and let him refashion, reorganize, restructure our motives that we might desire his will, his glory, his praise, his honor. Jesus knew that without power, the Holy Spirit, without the power of the Holy Spirit, Everything else they did would be in vain. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples going out and telling anybody about Jesus' resurrection would be in vain. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the, Holy, the, the, the apostles going out and laying hands on the sick people would be in vain. Without the Holy Spirit, words they spoke would fall on deaf ears. The Old Testament said in Zechariah, not by might nor by power, by my spirit, saith the Lord. But with the Spirit, all things are possible. Without the Spirit, all things are a failure. But with the Spirit, all things are possible. The Holy Spirit should, would show them the truth, would anoint their preaching, would draw sinners through them to the Savior. You know, two of the greatest preachers in history were John Charles Wesley. They had, they had a great idea one day. They were living in the British Isles, and they had a great idea. Hey, let's go to America and win Native Americans to Jesus. It was the mid-18th century. What a great plan. Let's go and win the Indians. But you know what? John Charles went to America, and they were utter and absolute failures and returned to England in defeat, dismay, and disgrace. Then the anointing of God and the timing of God came upon them, and they were responsible for reaching hundreds of thousands of people for Christ. All of us have to come to that same place of utter helplessness. An evaluation of our motives, where we restructure things that we might bring praise to him and not to ourselves. God wants you to bring you to the place where you know that you do not know. He is arranging your life so that you understand that you don't understand. He wants to bring you to the end of your cleverness so that your trust will be in him alone. Waiting purifies our motives because in the long hours while we wait, our pride crumbles and we realize that everything depends on God. Why do I want this shelter and place time to be over? What will I do then? What am I learning now? Will I remember my spiritual lessons? Have I allowed God to work in my life and to bring needed changes and motives? Am I just going to revert back to my old way? My way. Question number four, how's your gratitude? How's your attitude of gratitude? The fourth purpose of waiting on God is designed to increase our gratitude and develop a heart of thanksgiving. This point's akin to the last one, certainly follows up from last week's message on prayer. The longer the disciples waited for the Spirit to fall, I think the more they appreciated the answer when it finally came. I actually think 
that this is one reason our prayers usually are not answered the first time we pray. We would begin to take God for granted and to treat him like some sort of a celestial slot machine where we insert a prayer and out comes an answer. In abundance. Because God is our Heavenly Father, he makes us wait so that our gratitude might increase. Let me put it this way, and I don't want to sound judgmental, so I'm going to state this in the first person because it applies to me. Maybe if I was more grateful and thankful to the Lord, he would be quicker to answer my prayer. I don't know. But one thing I do know, when I wait and wait and then God answers, the longer I waited, the more thankful I am. I remember being on my knees one time telling God, as much as I don't like to wait, I've really come to realize that there's great pleasure, comfort, anticipation, and excitement in waiting on him. Here's an insight you may have never considered. When God puts us in a position of waiting on him, the answer is almost always going to surprise us. Consider the situation right here in Acts chapter 1. The Lord Jesus told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit. For days they prayed, O Lord, send the Holy Spirit. Whatever that meant, they didn't know what that meant yet. Because they were praying for something they had never seen, they had never felt, and they had never experienced before. They prayed in small groups, oh Lord, send the Holy Spirit. They prayed as a whole assembly, 120 of them. Oh Lord, send the Holy Spirit. They prayed individually, oh Lord, send the Holy Spirit. They probably lifted up their hands and said, oh Lord, send the Holy Spirit. Now, they knew something about the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament, even more from the words of Christ, but they really didn't know what they were praying for. They certainly had no idea of what was about to happen on the day of Pentecost. I can imagine a conversation among them on that day. Now, this is just my imagination. How much longer do we have to pray? I don't know. Well, how are we going to know when the Holy Spirit comes? I don't know. What if the Holy Spirit comes and we don't know it? What if the Holy Spirit comes and we missed it? We didn't notice. We didn't realize that was it. I don't know. Stop talking about it and keep praying. Pray for the Holy Spirit. So there they were on the day of Pentecost, praying. Not knowing when the Holy Spirit would be sent. Maybe one of the disciples looked up, looked at another one, and said, Whoa! Hey! There's fire coming out the top of your head! That disciple looked up and, what? Wow, your head's on fire too. Then came a noise like a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly one of them started speaking in Greek and he didn't know Greek. Another in Midian and he didn't know Midian. Another in Parthian, another in Egyptian, another in Cappadocian, and none of them knew the languages. It was a wild scene in Jerusalem as the Holy Spirit came with power, fire, wind, and languages. Their prayers were answered, but in a manner far beyond their expectations. When God answers our prayer, often, often, he answers beyond our understanding, beyond our greatest expectation. The people who saw it thought the disciples were drunk. They weren't drunk at all. They were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God was doing things his way. Had they not waited, they'd have been going out doing things their own way. But now they're going to do things God's way, and God was doing things right now his own way. He's the God of great surprises. He makes us wait so that he can surprise us in the future and increase our gratitude when the answer finally comes. How's your attitude of gratitude during this time? How's your attitude of gratitude today? What have you thanked God for today? What have you thanked God for this last week? What have you thanked God for in the midst of this shelter-in-place order? Oh, 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 how much I have to be thankful for. I have prayed for the safety of my wife. She's particularly vulnerable. I have prayed for the safety of my family 
every single day. There's 36 of us with kids and spouses and grandchildren. I have a granddaughter with no functioning kidneys. If she gets this virus, it could be fatal. I'm not sitting around with my fingers crossed hoping. I'm praying and I'm thanking God every day for protecting my family. I prayed for the safety of you. Those of you that are part of this church physically here, those of you that are watching online from all over the place, I pray for your safety. The safety of my friends. And I give thanks to God. I give thanks to God every single day. He's cared for us. He's provided for us. We have not lacked. We have not been in want. We have not gotten sick. Are you thanking God daily? Give thanks. Question number five. Who's your God? Who's your God? And purpose number five, that we might discover anew who the real God God is that we serve. Waiting on God causes us to remember that he is God and we are not. And folks, when I say, who is your God? I'm telling you, it is a constant struggle in every single person's life to be their own God. Oh, I don't think any of us have um, a temptation to carve, whittle some God out of a piece of wood or chisel it out of stone but we sure have a tendency to rely upon ourselves as if we are God, as if we are ultimate, ultimate omnipotent, all-knowing. Jesus told those assembled disciples two things that must have been hard to hear. Stay in Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Father. Now Luke tells us, because Luke wrote this, that verse 4 that says, stay and wait, Luke tells us that he commanded them to do that. Luke uses that word, commanded them to do these things. This isn't a suggestion from Jesus. This isn't something to be negotiated with him. This is a command from a superior to his inferiors. If it is God telling his servants what they must do, because God is God and we are not, he often does things that make little sense to us. In the Old Testament, he guided his people with the cloud by day and fiery pillar by night. Sometimes the cloud would move for days on end. Day after day, day after day, day after day, they followed that cloud. Then it would stop. Here? What's here? Desert. Rock. There's no life. There's no water. There's no food. Nothing. Why did we stop here? Then it would move again. And then it would stop. No explanation given. The only command was this, follow the cloud. When the cloud goes, you glow. When the the cloud stops, you stop. You know what? I'm sure there were times when the weary Jews felt like shouting, why don't you just stop and let us rest, God? Or just move on and get us there. We're tired of waiting. Maybe when they'd been such a long time in the desert they might have cried out saying Lord we've been here long enough can't we move on now you know what there's times in the Christian life when God's only command is to wait when those moments come God rarely explains himself or makes the big picture clear to us all of this reminds us that in the end our God is sovereign and he chooses the times and the places in life for us. He sets the path for each of his children and he doesn't consult us in advance. I find myself saying if this doesn't end soon, I'm going to fill in the blank. All of us say that. I see it on Facebook. If this doesn't end soon, I'm going to and then fill in the blank. Everybody's got their own little answer. I'm going to do it anyway. This is me trying to be God. I am resolved to wait until God says go because he is God and I am not. How soon till we have church services here again? Well, I believe they're getting soon. I believe we're close, folks. Hang on, hang on. But the elders are resolved not to move until we feel God says go. Let me conclude. One of the things my mom used to always tell me when I was a kid is, Russell, just quit fretting about it. Fretting. 
I don't hear people use the word fret a lot, but my mom used it all the time. Fret, fret. Quit fretting. You know what, folks? Quit fretting against the Lord. Do you know what the Bible says that? The Bible says that. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patient for him and do not fret. Yeah, we are fretters. The word fret in the Hebrew means to feel or express worry, annoyance, discontent, or the like. Worry. Are you fretting? Annoyance at all this. Are you fretting? I'm discontent, God, with where I am right now. Are you fretting? You know what? We're all waiting on God through this pandemic. Some of us are waiting well, and some of us are waiting poorly. How's your wait? But you know what? Other people are waiting on God for other things too. What should you do? Here's my counsel to you. Don't fret against the Lord. Don't panic. Do not take matters into your own hands. Do not take the timing into your own hands. Trust God each day as God shows it to you through his word and through guidance, through your prayers. Surrender your life to God. Thy will be done. Make that your prayer. Record your victories. Write them down. Put pencil to paper. Record your victories that you might never forget. But what should we do while we wait? Ah, what a perfectly American question that is. Because we always want to do something. We don't want to sit and wait. We don't want to sit and be silent. Well, let me suggest to you this. When you get out of bed in the morning, pray this prayer, Lord, help me to live my life today with joy and in obedience to you. Lord, help me to live my life today, this day of waiting. Help me to live my life today with joy. And help me to live this day in obedience to you. Trust him. Do it with a smile while you wait on God. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Don't condemn. Don't condemn our nation's leadership. Pray for them. That will glorify your Father and will prepare you for whatever is to come. The best way to get ready for tomorrow is to do God's will today and it's at its core, waiting, waiting, catch this, waiting is about becoming more like Christ and relying on God. Waiting is Christ-likeness. Waiting is godliness. Waiting is becoming more like him. It's not that waiting is easy or enjoyable. Often it's very difficult. In the end, we have this consolation. God works through our waiting to make us like Jesus, to conform us to his image. We serve an on-time God. He's never early. He's never late. He's always right on time, which means that our waiting serves his purposes in ways we don't even understand. And so, during this time, God wants you to rearrange your priorities, to test and strengthen your faith, to purify your motives, to increase your attitude of gratitude, and to remind you that he is God, and we are not. God is the great mover. We want to do. We want to push. We want to go. We want to act. We want to work. We want to dash in where angels fear to tread. But if we wait on the Lord in patient trust, remembering that God is in control, doing his work of increasing our faith, our strength, and our purity, then we'll experience the move of God in our lives and in our church and in our nation. Amen? And all God's people said, Amen. And now, as you learn to wait upon the Lord and his time, may you seek him in this period of waiting and not let this glorious time be lost or idled away or wasted. 
May you trust the Almighty One who has promised to meet your every need, realizing that He is with you always in places of shelter, in places of exposure, in places of safety, and in places of harm. He is with you always. May you hear from heaven during this time that you might examine your priorities, strengthen your faith, purify your motives, increase your gratitude, and surrender to the God above all gods. To him be glory forever and ever in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. As I mentioned before, the financial needs of this church will continue in, to exist even as our many ministries and services are canceled. The church will still be here when all of this is said and done. And so we still have monthly bills to pay, utilities, mission support, and salaries. We need your help. So what can you do? Pray and continue to obey the Lord through your financial giving. If you're watching online, you can give through the mail by sending a check to the church or you can give online by going to the church website and clicking the donate button. May God bless your faithfulness to him.